Hello, data friends. It's Camille again. Welcome in the sixth episode of Ask SQL Family podcast. We have a real star of Microsoft here today, Bob Ward, principal architect, who recently celebrated his 30 years anniversary working at Microsoft. Bob spent this time working on our favorite product, which is SQL Server. And that's one of the reasons why this product is so great, mature and has high performance. Let's dive into the conversation we recorded a few years ago and see what we can learn from Bob Ward. Welcome to Ask SQL Family podcast. This is episode number six. And our guest today is Bob Ward. Hi, Bob. Uh, Hi, hello. Good morning. Hello. Uh, thank you for accepting my invi invitation for that podcast, uh, Secure Player. Happy to be uh, here. Yeah. <laughs> It's very good to see you again, basically, because we met the uh, first time at uh, SQL Day. It was uh, three years ago. I think it's been a couple of years yeah, yeah, since yeah. I've been there. Yeah, I enjoyed it. It was a great conference. It was fun. Yeah, this is this conference probably is the, the best in the world. Yeah, how, how do you it's, think? It's certainly the largest in the world. Um, I'm not sure I would always just say best because like, I, I, one of the things I love about conferences like SQL Day is being smaller is that I get an opportunity to meet people uh -huh. closer one-on-one -on -one and talk to them. So yeah. I get to do that here at PASS, uh, but it's like 4,000 people, right? So yeah. there's a lot of people here. It is a great conference. Yeah. And, and one of the things that makes it really good is just so many different varieties of topics and yeah. so many experts. The, the top yeah. experts in the world for SQL Server are here at this conference. Yeah, there's many of tracks and uh, exactly Absolutely. good opportunity to, to, to meet people and uh, talk with them face to face. Meet a lot of them, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, uh, could you introduce yourself? I know that sure. probably <laughs> all the attendees know you very well, but <laughs> could you sure. introduce yourself? Sure, my name is Bob Ward. Uh, I work for Microsoft. Uh, my title is Principal Architect, mm -hmm. and I actually now work for the SQL engineering team. Mm -hmm. um, I've been at Microsoft now 24 years. I just I just turned wow, 24 yeah. years anniversary at Microsoft this last week. Um, and last week, yeah. last week, wow. yeah. Mo most of my career, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> most of my career um, up, up until the last few years was working in support. I was in our support team. In fact, when I was in SQL Day, I was still in the support team as an escalation engineer. So mm -hmm. I, I did a lot of deep troubleshooting on hard customer problems. Uh, and then I got to join the engineering team here. And I've been now here a couple of years, and I spent a lot of time still working with customers. Uh -huh. I also spent a lot of time doing evangelism of some of the work that we do. Um, uh, you know, for example, um, I've got a talk I'm doing today on performance. I'm doing a lot of yeah. performance work. I did a talk on Linux yesterday, and I was part of the keynote, as the you maybe saw. Very internal things, yeah. Yeah, internal yeah stuff. so, 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 <laughs> no, what, what you asked me about internals, and there's no question I have a reputation for doing that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I love doing that. Um, but I've also expanded out to make sure that I do talks that are more intermediate level talks and uh, explaining the value. The talk I'm doing today on performance uh, here at the conference is about SQL Server 2017 and performance. And it, it, I would not consider it a deep internals talk, right? Um, so I've kind of tried to broaden my my expansion of talking about things that are not always just about internals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and basically, uh, currently I heard that uh, SQL Server 2017 is the fastest in the world, yeah? So, what is the next achievement? I think so. I think so. I think so. So, currently, the SQL Server 2017 is the faster database engine in the world. Yeah? I think so, so yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so what is the next goal? What is the <laughs> well, we, you know, we're obviously going to continue to make it fast, right? Anytime mm -hmm. we release a new version of SQL Server, we're always going to look for better performance. One thing to keep in mind uh, about SQL Server that I take pride in is price performance. So it's not just about being the fastest database in the world, it's about being the most affordable fastest database oh, in the world. Fine. So, I mean, you maybe you saw in the keynote uh, here at Pass. I did a demonstration using HPE's new uh, Gen 10 server technology mm -hmm. in, a, in a technology called persistent scalable memory. And this concept is where HP's devised the ability to combine uh, standard RAM modules, memory modules, with SSD drives mm -hmm. as storage. So yeah. you can access memory as storage in very, very fast time, yes. right? And But what's cool about it is it's about 50% of the cost of a normal system for that same amount of space using all SSD drives. So yeah. 
And if you think about that, that's pretty groundbreaking, right? So uh, think about a world where SQL Server could potentially access memory as though it were disk in a way that bypasses the software storage layers. I mean, what if we could get rid of page IO latch weights or something? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think, think about those kind of things, right? Like get rid of all the IO weighting that you're used to seeing, yeah, right, in, yeah. in SQL. Those are the kind of type uh, advances that we'll certainly look at in the future. Yeah, it could be even imaginable 10 years ago, yeah? Uh, yeah, nobody would have thought we would be doing anything. I mean, think about, if you think about drive technology and storage technology, that's one of the things I love about our company is we're always going to be partnering with other other companies to say let's take advantage of the greatest innovation that's out there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we're always thinking in terms of price performance though, right? It's not just about fast. It's like can we find uh, speed for people that's affordable for them instead of having to spend millions of dollars on yeah. amazing hardware. So that's one thing I'm pretty excited we're looking at. Yeah, nice, nice. So your your job is very exciting. Yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> I think it's an exciting product. Um, you know, if you think about the strategy of what you've seen us do right now at Microsoft with SQL Server, uh, the SQL Server engine still in, ends up being one of the most popular database engines in the planet, but we're pretty serious about our cloud technology. Uh, maybe you've heard of something called Managed Database Instance, which is us taking SQL Azure database and exposing that in a way that looks like SQL Server, like you get to do SQL agent jobs and mm -hmm. link server queries mm -hmm. and thi things that you couldn't do before in Azure Database that were more constrained, now we open that up, but still give you the power of the cloud. So I, I actually am excited about the ability we give choice to customers. You want to run it in your cloud? We'll make SQL great for you, right? We'll do it on Linux, we'll do it on Windows, we'll do it in containers. Yeah. But if you want to choose our public cloud technology, it's actually becoming pretty good. Yeah, so, sure, yeah. sure. Bob, do you think that uh, at some point of time, uh, we are going to not use anything on premises. We go to the cloud only. Is it the only option for us? Yeah, I, I don't see that happening anytime soon. We're pretty committed to giving you a choice. When we when we talk about cloud, uh, often we'll use the term cloud first, but not cloud only for SQL Server. And what we mean what we mean by that is that we will do innovation in our cloud products and and iterate on it and make it successful, and then bring it down to on premise uh, at the right time. Um, and so, you think about some of the work we're doing with, I, I demonstrated automatic tuning or query store and some of these features. Those were first born in the cloud in Azure Database. And then we kind of used those with some customers and got really good at it. And then we pushed it into our, our almost premise product. You know, uh, Damien, in the keynote yesterday, Rohan asked for a show of hands, like how many people are ready to move to the cloud, right? And very few people really raised their hand. Yeah. It doesn't mean that people are not thinking about it, but we realize that a vast majority of customers still love SQL Server and want to run it in their cloud, right? So you're not going to see anytime soon us abandon that. I mean, we're yeah. going to continue to do that, but what we're going to do is going to give people choice for folks that do want to move to the cloud and make that innovation and make it successful. And one thing you're going to see is us continue to uh, expand on the scalability of what's in the cloud. We're going to start you know, pushing more for larger database sizes, larger memory footprints, faster storage, so that people that are ready to make that transition can do it. Some companies I've talked to are kind of thinking a split model. Right? They want to continue, well, they're, they're, uh, their current applications are going to run on premise, but if they're mm -hmm. building a brand new application, they're taking a serious look at the cloud yeah, as yeah. a possibility. Yeah, I think that people are still thinking about it and uh, yeah. some DBAs are afraid, uh, are afraid of that. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think DBAs are afraid of it only because they, they think, okay, well, if this thing moves to the cloud, I don't have to do anything anymore. I think if you take a look at Azure Database, I think that's false. Um, yes, we've tried to put automation and things in there to help developers and customers, but in the, the day, query performance, query tuning, uh, index design, some of those things are still important to make things run well. And so you're still going to have a need to do that, even if you're running in a, a cloud type situation. And like I said, I think for, for, for the foreseeable future, customers are running in both worlds. And so I think, the, quite frankly, the, it's an exciting time for a DBA or data yeah. professional because how about trying to learn both worlds and having that skill set? That would be kind of actually a very good skill to have. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I would like to ask about SQL Server on Linux because yeah. I can remember our discussion, let's say, three years ago in Wrocław during SQL Day. And I know that we ask you, what, how big effort would it be to move from SQL Server to Linux? And you said to us that, well, it, it would really be a, a, a very big effort uh, because of how SQL Server is built. And now, three years later, we can see like a new star. We have SQL Server on, on, on Linux working. It's very fast and uh, people are really, really looking for an adoption. So they try to do this. 
So my question would be, do you think that uh, you can go to any other operation system? Can you see something like this apart from Windows and Linux? Yeah, Damien, it's a good question. And I guess I wasn't a very good uh, predictor, was I, <laughs> back three years ago? Uh, well, what I didn't know back then, what I know now, and quite frankly, which what happened not too long after I, I left your Poland conference is there was a Microsoft research project called Drawbridge. And this, pro this project uh, for Microsoft Research was to, was to really the goal was to find a way to run SQL Server in a Windows environment, almost like a container, like mm -hmm. what you hear about containers today. Yeah. And so it was really brilliant design and it, and it provided the ability for teams like us to take the work they did and say, I think we can find a way to make SQL Server core engine, the core engine of SQL Server, run on Linux, but make it think it's running in Windows but do it in a way that's lightweight and, and fast, mm -hmm. um, and so you still get the performance. So that's one of the things that we're able to make this po uh, possible, right? So when, when we've got SQL Server on Linux, we have pieces of code that are compiled for Linux, and those are the ones that talk directly to the kernel, to the Linux kernel. Um, but SQL Server itself, it runs actually in a process space in Linux, and, and that code is unchanged. It's still the same code that runs on Windows. And That's so, amazing, yeah. And when the engine runs, it doesn't really know. And, and Damien, the reason we achieve that is that this is still all Intel assembly code, right? No matter what happens, whether it's running on a Linux operating system or running on a Windows operating system, it's still Intel assembly code. We've just found a very clever way to run that assembly code and not worry about the fact of whether it's on Linux or Windows because using this drawbridge concept, we, we have this layer, a very lightweight layer that knows how to talk to the Linux kernel and knows how to take all the calls that SQL make that need the kernel, whether it's IO or thread or network or memory and make that call. So your question about, you know, can we go to other operating systems? We surely have set ourselves up for that. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's something that we've got on our plate, like we're looking at other o OS footprints, mm -hmm. but the architecture of what we built, what we call SQL PAL, um, which you should think of as the new SQL OS, right? We've talked about SQL OS before. That certainly has set ourselves up for if we want to do that in the future, we actually probably could. Uh -huh. So Bob, this, uh, this podcast is not only about the technical stuff. Okay. Yeah? Uh, I okay. think uh, <laughs> many people would like to uh, know you, uh, maybe some of your hobbies, habits, and etc. Sure. So sure. tell us, uh, what is your hobby, for example? Well, if, it, if, you, if you talk to me or see me here in the United States when you hear me speak, I'm a big sports fan. Um, uh, may, maybe you've seen me before, even when I do demos, I use sports teams' names yes. and so forth, right? So <laughs> absolutely, sports is a huge hobby of mine. I'm a huge fan. I play sports. Uh, I like to play golf. Uh, my two sons, I have two sons, Ryan and Troy. Uh, Ryan, my younger son, is still in college and he plays college mm -hmm. baseball in America. Mm -hmm. And so I love to go watch him play baseball. Uh, my older son, Troy, also played baseball in college. He's now graduated. Uh, but so, yeah, I'm a big sports fan. That's still something that I just enjoy doing. I love going to games or watching on TV. And I love all sports, by the way. Wow, Heck, great. man, I, 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 and, and so you might find this interesting, uh, being from Poland, uh, is that I was a soccer player in college. That was my sport. So what you call football, you know, we call soccer here. Uh, that was actually what I was really good at. Um, so I played college uh, soccer and enjoyed it very much. And so that's one of my biggest hobbies. The other, the other thing um, that I'm really big, uh, strong is my faith, my Christian faith. I'm a very strong Christian faith man. And so I spent a lot of time at my church, uh, volunteering with my church and, okay. and helping out. I, <clears throat> I helped out with our youth program for many years, the high, what we call the high school age. And I still do that. I still volunteer and help out our youth program. Um, so that's another big thing that's a huge part of the center of my life. Yeah, you told me yesterday that your wife uh, has been in uh, Łódź in Poland, yeah? Can you believe that? Uh, <laughs> you came up to me yesterday and it was so funny that Poland was on my mind. That, that, uh, and I, how am I get, I don't, I'm, I'm going to say the American pronunciation, Lotz. Uh -huh. is, that, is that right? Lotz, but it's Łódź. Łódź, Łódź. Łódź. Yes. So, so my wife had an opportunity to go to Łódź uh, as a missionary to spend two weeks there in a program called Let's Start Talking where she taught uh, people from Poland English. But we used the Christian Bible to do this with, yes. right? And she loved that city. She had so much fun in Wuj. It was so nice. Uh, I guess, uh, is, is, is beets something you eat a lot in Poland? Beets, you know, this vegetable, beets? B-E-E-T-S? Beets, uh, she just I every, <laughs> Yeah, she's, everybody loves beets there. I don't know uh, what that was. I'm not the, sure what is the Polish name. Yeah, you can look yeah. at you can look check, at the translation. Check in the meantime. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a, it's, a, it's a vegetable. It's a dark red vegetable. Uh, and everything that she ate there had a lot of beets in it. Oh, of course, we love it. Uh, Kamil, uh, Bob is saying about buraki. 
So Buraki, what, the red ones. Uh, yes, yes, ah, okay, yes, yeah, yes, yes, yes. It's please. a very popular okay, thing. And my wife loves this yeah. actually in America, so <laughs> she enjoyed this. But she also got to do something fun. She got to go to Warsaw for a few days. Uh, I'm, I'm a very big, I, I love history. You asked about mm -hmm. hobbies, I love history. I love World War II history. Oh. And she got to go to some places in Wuj, uh, which I didn't realize was one of the largest populations for Jewish of people uh, during that time, World War II. Uh, and then she also went to Warsaw to visit some very historical places. So uh, I was kind of jealous of her <laughs> that she did this. But she was there for like two and a half weeks. Okay. And she loved the Polish people. In fact, um, she loved them so much that one of the, the people that she met that, that uh, works as a missionary, he's Polish, in Wuj, he came to my home uh, last week. He mm -hmm. was visiting the U.S. Mm -hmm. and we had him at home. And he talked more about Poland and the, and the history. And I told him I had been to, uh, well, I probably pronounce it wrong. I say Rosh, Roszla. Wrocław. Oh my yeah, gosh. Fine. <laughs> Try Wrocław. Maybe well, it'll be well, much, much Well, easier. you'll find this funny, but you guys may not remember this, but when I came several years ago, I used the Texan pronunciation, which is Rocklaw. <laughs> so if you, if you, if you, if you see this, if you see the city uh, spelled as a Texan, you would say Rocklaw. That's how you would say it in Texan. That's good. Also, so, yeah. I think we should record uh, uh, all the guys uh, from uh, uh, the USA, for example, with different pronunciation of, of our city. Of your city, yes. So <laughs> Texan. If you were in the south of the U.S., they would say Rocklaw, probably. So. And that's what. In fact, I was at the airport, I think, in Frankfurt. I said, "How do you get to? You know, where's the gate for Rocklaw?" And the lady who's German said, yeah, yeah. Wow, what? What? <laughs> she, had no <laughs> idea. she had no idea what she's talking about. So. Yeah, so you know, you, you don't have to be jealous. Yeah? You still have, uh, you, you can uh, come, back. come to us. Yeah, yeah yes, so yes. I do, I'd like to do that someday, yeah, sure. <laughs> the invitation for you is to Oh, thank you. It, yeah? Thank you very much. <laughs> and what, what about your work-life balance? You know, this is a very popular um, topic. It is, it is, and it's a struggle. Uh, I think it's a struggle for anybody yeah. in technology, uh, exactly, quite frankly. Yeah. And I, I That's why I'm asking for this. Yeah, I've been in Microsoft <laughs> for 24 years, and so, it's always been a struggle, but I will tell you that my family is very important to me. Um, and so my family comes first. Um, so, you know, I do some creative things uh, at Microsoft. Microsoft's such an amazing company to work for. They allow flexible hours, flexible work schedules. Sometimes I work from home. Uh, so I try to use creative ways to make sure I, I dedicate time to those hobbies I talked about, but also to my family. Uh, now, it's a little easier for me today because both of my boys are, are out of my house now. They're grown men, right? Uh, but I still want to connect with them, right? And uh, my mother, my, my other parts of my family live in Texas. So um, I just try to make sure that I'm conscious about it every week. Sometimes I slip like everybody else and mm -hmm. I'm working at home. But, but maybe for a couple of days, I will, I will shut my computer off and I won't, when I get home, and I just won't turn it back on again. Or I won't use a computer for a couple of days. Uh, or I'll turn my phone off or something like that. I try oh, to really? force myself, okay. yes, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. But I try to force myself every once in a while. I'll tell you one thing I do on vacation, a personal vacation, mm -hmm. is I will shut my email off. Okay. Yeah, company email. So when for I'm, two days or two weeks? No, the whole time. The, yeah, the whole time. The whole time. I could be on a vacation for a week with my family, uh -huh. and I will not read any email from my company for a week. It right. doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And I told my boss, I guess you can call me if an emergency, like the world's coming uh, it's really to the end. Yeah. But I, I try to make sure I don't do that, and that's really helpful. That's a great tip for anybody. Don't don't read company email while you're on vacation because it, it forces you to dedicate your time to your vacation. And right? you're starting to be addicted. Absolutely, yeah. you become addicted to things, so no question. Yeah. Damian? Yes, I would like to start, uh, ask you about uh, when did you start interesting in SQL Server? So oh my gosh. Probably it, it, it wow. runs uh, SQL Server. This, this, is, this is an interesting story. So um, I came out of college um, as a, and, and, and developed a skill in C programming when, when back in the 19, late 80s, that was a new thing. Um, you know, I, I came out of college in 1986, so nobody really knew C programming very much back then. And so I quickly learned how to write C programming on Unix systems. And I joined a job where somebody said, hey, we'd like you to be our, our developer and database administrator on something called Ingress, <laughs> which is a database system from many, many years ago, okay. and eventually Oracle. Mm -hmm. And so I just developed a learning for the SQL language and database systems because I was kind of forced to in a job early on as a, as a programmer. And so, uh, in the early 90s, I was looking for potentially a new, a new thing to do, and a friend of my wife's was working for Microsoft and said they were looking for people that knew database products, and especially Oracle skills, because SQL Server back then was just a very small product on OS2. Nobody really used or knew SQL a lot. It was based on Sybase, so you know, that would have been a plus, but I knew Oracle really well. So one of the reasons why I got hired at Microsoft is I had these Oracle skills, but I also had this development skills. So, my, my people that hired me said, we think you could be very valuable for us in the support space because you know how to program and write code 
you could probably easily debug customer problems because you know how to be a programmer. Mm -hmm. So I actually very early on learned how to read the SQL Server source code. That was pretty fun for me. Wow. <laughs> but I, I was reading the SQL Server engine source code back in 1994, uh, how we wrote it. And throughout these years, that's one of the things I love about my job is I have the ability still to go look at our source code and, and kind of uh, translate it for every, everybody. If you think about these internal talks that I do, that's really me translating our source code. Yeah, we still remember uh, <laughs> your, your, your uh, workshops and probably most of the people uh, don't understand a uh, whole, and I mean, whole session. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's, it's hard. Me. <laughs> it's, it's hard, it's hard. I, I, I haven't found it fun though. I, I, I enjoy transferring knowledge mm -hmm. to people. That's one thing I love about my job. Um, I get great pleasure out of doing, of translating very difficult topics uh, not that everybody else is not smart, but mm, yeah. you know you don't have access to the source code. Or you just spend all your time on it, right? Mm -hmm. So, but that's kind of my history in SQL. Uh, kind of forced to do it as a job back a mm -hmm. long time ago mm -hmm. as a young a young college graduate, <laughs> and I loved it. I was like, oh, I like this database stuff. This is kind of fun, right? And uh, I had some also friends of mine that were saying that's a great skill, you know, to have. So you know, Ingress, Oracle, that was my background, yeah. and then obviously and you're still doing that, yeah. That's yeah, amazing. and now I'm a SQL <laughs> Server guy, yeah, exactly. Okay, I just wanted to say that. Um, well, um, because I attended a lot of sessions, uh, in your sessions, Bob, and I can see that you can explain everything, even if those things are very complicated, because you have an enormous passion. So you can talk about complicated things in a very easy way, so people can understand, most of them at least, can understand. But um, it's okay, we can, we can understand pretty, pretty complicated thing unless, uh, uh, unless we have uh, uh, a teacher like you. That, that's my opinion. And that's so I kind of you to say, thank you. <laughs>
And during this three mile run, I'll be rehearsing in my mind what I'm going to say. And typically, every time I run, I have some new idea of something, wow. right? Uh, <laughs> that, oh, I need to change this slide, or, or I need to make sure I cover this. And so, even, the last minute. And even uh, sometimes I'm on my run, I'll take my phone out and I'll, I'll say something. Recording. I'm recording okay. on my phone. Mm -hmm. Hey, Bob, don't forget to mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. change something. So I found that exercising is a great way to clear your mind, yeah. and it helps you think about things in a new way. So a lot of preparation goes into these talks. I also am a big believer in making sure that demos are done early. Like always do your demos early on because you don't want to put things on your slides that you can't back up with a demo. Okay, yeah. So I do my demos uh, early okay. in my presentation. Mm, yeah. Good to know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Another thing to remember. Yeah, exactly. <laughs>uh, well, first of all, you mentioned about passion. Since I have a passion for the technology, that makes it a lot easier. You know, if you're passionate about something, it's a lot easier to learn something new. And I also, you gotta love learning. I mean, if you're afraid to learn new things or transition your career, then, you know, you can't teach people stuff. So, um, so again, just having the passion meeting in the first place. One of the biggest things I do when I try to take on something brand new, and I'll give you an example. I, about a year ago, I was challenged by my vice president to start teaching people about machine learning services. This is R and Python and so forth. Well, I didn't know anything about, <laughs> I didn't know anything about that stuff, right? <laughs> so I start from the perspective of a user. Okay. Like I, I learn how to use the software first. Like why would somebody want to use this, right? I'd go look for case studies and value propositions and business cases. So even though you see some of my talks that are very technical, I actually start something new from the perspective of why? Why would you want to do this, right? Because if you don't have that in your mind, who cares about the technical part, right? So exactly. so I always start from that, I always start from this kind of high level perspective and then I start figuring out, okay, how does it work? Because as you've seen in my talks, I love to explain how it works. Yeah. But if you can't explain the value of why somebody would want to use this new technology, it doesn't really matter if you can explain how it works. So I kind of combine those two together, yeah. and that's how I teach something new, is I start from that perspective, like how to do it, and how would you use it, and why does it matter? And, and sometimes, I've, to be honest with you, I've been asked to look at a new topic that I didn't really think was all that great. <laughs> and so I, I didn't have a lot of passion for doing it because mm -hmm, if mm -hmm. I, like, let's take, a, let's take an example on Linux. You know, I used to be a Unix developer, right? And so I love it, I love Linux. And so it was very easy for me to start building training on Linux because I like it. And I think it's valuable. Now I can see it was your idea. Uh, I don't know about that. It was not my idea. It's not my idea. <laughs> I remember that Twitter yesterday, you know? <laughs> it's not my idea. I mean, you, that's why I brought up uh, Tobias and uh, Slava and Travis. Those are the founders of this, right? Um, mm -hmm. No, but. But I think Linux is very valuable for customers that want to be on Linux. I mean, there are people in the technology world that think Linux is a better operating system than Windows. I'm going to stay neutral because I'm supporting mm -hmm. SQL Server now both on Windows and Linux. Mm -hmm. I think Windows has many great capabilities and that's what I've used for years. But hey, there's people out there that are Linux people. That's what they want to do, right? Maybe you've used Postgres on Linux for years and that's what you'd like to do, but Postgres doesn't meet your performance needs anymore because you've scaled up, but you want to stay on Linux. Well, that's why we did this. We I mean, put SQL on this platform so people that love that operating system have a, have a choice now and have an opportunity. We had a customer DV01, which we've, we've been very, uh, you know, showing uh, out to the world, here's a great customer that did, and that's exactly what happened to them. Big Linux shop, big Postgres developer shop, but Postgres would meet their performance needs, and so I didn't know what to do. Well, they saw, they saw us start going after the Linux uh, mm -hmm. proposition, and they became big fans very quickly. So that's kind of how I, I, I believe about teaching new things, is you have to yeah. have a passion for it, yeah. and you've got to be able to explain to somebody why they would even want to use the technology. Yeah, the business needs first, and Absolutely. the user experience And then the first. user experience, and then you start talking about how it works, right? Yeah, yeah. Because I think so. if you talk about something, how it works, it gives people an appreciation. Mm -hmm. uh, machine learning services, one of the reasons I, I started presenting on how that works is to give DBAs a trust factor that they could trust running this software. Mm -hmm. Because you're a DBA, you're like, I'm not gonna let our scripts run on my SQL <laughs> server, right? I don't trust that. But if you understand the, the architecture and what we built, then you become more comfortable with that. Yeah, yeah, true, okay. Uh, about achievements, what achievement are, are you satisfied the most? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> I tell you what, I, I, I tell you, I know what, it, as, as far as uh, SQL server goes, let's talk about that first. 
Um, I think the biggest achievement I'm most proud of is that there are features today in the product that I felt directly responsible for, uh, especially when I was back in support. You look at extended events, maybe you've seen this feature, extended events. Well, I was one of the people that first you know, proposed that technology along with Slava Oaks to be in the product. I mean, Slava came to me and said, hey, we have this new technology, okay. what do you think, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah. So I remember being in meetings with the development team and the development leaders pushing to say, we should put this in this product because it's that good, right? You look at dynamic management views, if you can believe this, that was also another one. Back in the days before we had DMVs, uh, myself, Robert Dore, and others in support, we would do uh, these these really long debugging sessions to solve problems with Windows debuggers, which is great, uh -huh. but it would take hours, right? Yeah, exactly. And so Slava was the kind of person that came to us in support and said, hey, let's work together to build this DMV concept. And so, I mean- So I, it was before DMV has happened? We yeah. would use debuggers. Okay, yeah. wow. Yeah, and so now this DMV, <laughs> you know, Slava came back in 2005, was that was, that, was the first release where he said, hey, Let's put these DMVs in here that can really help do debugging using SQL queries. And not uh, only for you, but also for, for everybody the, else, right? Yeah, exactly. yeah. For So everyone. those are the kind of features. I think about the work I did with Paul Randall. You, you know Paul Randall. Yeah, of course. Paul used to be in the development team. Paul, Paul was big passion about corruption scenarios, check DB, things in the storage engine, all these different types of technologies, you, you name it, right? That was like DBCC commands. Yeah. And and Paul would we would work directly with Paul to add these features into the product. So those are huge accomplishments for SQL I'm proud of. Mm -hmm. From a personal perspective, um, I'm just so excited that I have two great, wonderful young boys um, that I consider to be great now, great young men. Mm -hmm. they're, they're men of high character. And it makes, it just swells me with great pride when I've heard other people uh, tell me that they come and they've asked them, hey, Ryan, Troy, what, 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 is, what do you like about your dad the most, right? And they said, my dad is a person who has high ethics, high integrity, and high responsibility. Wow. And when I hear that, and those are those boys talking about me, mm -hmm. that makes me feel very special. And it makes me feel special that I've instilled that same sense of character into them. So. Wow, that's nice, yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you think that the um, Microsoft Ignite recently has happened? Uh, it's mm -hmm. a bigger or better conference than uh, the past summit? The past, you know, how, my, how, how can you <laughs> compare it? Well, I've been there now. I've been at all yeah. the Microsoft Ignites, all yeah. three of them. And of course, I've been at PASS since 2003. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I've been at PASS a long time. You know, these are really two different conferences in a way. Okay. Um, and, and I actually treat them a little bit differently. Um, Microsoft Ignite is now the largest IT conference in the world. I, mean, I think this year we had almost like 30,000 people come to that conference. And certainly SQL Server and our data technologies are a part of that conference, but it's much larger than that, right? Okay. It's a showcase and a way for people across the world to come talk to Microsoft and our partners and the community about a wide range of Microsoft products, whether it's the cloud or SQL or Windows or whatever it may be, right? SQL Server, the past summit is all about data. This is a data conference, right? If you like data, you come here. So I, I kind of, I think they complement each other. Um, I think that you will see some content at Ignite presented also at PASS, like I'm doing that. I'm presenting a, a talk at Ignite here at PASS because some people didn't get to go to Ignite, right? Mm -hmm. But you'll also see, you will never see me do inside Linux at Ignite <laughs> because the audience that normally comes to that yeah. doesn't want to see that, yeah, right? Too deeply. Um, a, little, a little too deep, yeah. So Ignite will never be a deep internals conference mm -hmm. for me ever. Mm -hmm. It'll be more about the value proposition of our performance uh, gains. Whereas PASS provides this unique opportunity. I mean, right now you and I are sitting here in the, in the data clinic, right? Yeah. We don't have such a thing at Ignite, right? I mean, this is a... You Basically, that's an amazing place, yeah? You can, yeah. Uh, you can come here and ask about everything. anything. I, I yeah. mean, if you look at this right now, you can just see all these people all asking questions to these experts. A funny story about the clinic that you'll find interesting as we're wrapping up here. Um, you remember, maybe you've heard this gentleman, Ken Henderson, that was an expert in the SQL community uh -huh. many, many years ago. Yeah. Ken, many years. do you remember Ken Henderson? Uh, yeah, but... Uh, He's, he died like uh, 10 years ago, he, I think. He, he did, he passed away in around the 2008 yeah. time frame. But Ken is the reason I got involved in all these speaking engagements and in pass. And you're gonna find this a funny story here, but in 2003, um, at the first pass summit uh, that I attended, Ken and I started this clinic concept by sitting in a room, I, I'm not making this up, we sat in a room with a couple of computers and a desk, a couple of chairs, and we just announced, anybody wants to ask us questions, just come in. It wasn't like this. It wasn't this organized thing with desks and chairs and whiteboards and so forth. It was just Ken and I, just two people. And the first day, we had like two people. Yeah. And so the next day, they made an announcement at the keynote, hey, Ken Anderson and Bob Ward are in this room answering questions. 
the next day, so many people came in, the fire marshal had to like move people out of the room because too many people yeah. were in the room <laughs> causing a, a possible uh -huh, fire uh -huh. hazard, right? And we called, it, we called it something else back then, but now it's birthed into this IC of the Microsoft Data Clinic, which is amazing to me. Yeah. You know, anybody in this conference, for no charge, no extra charge, can walk in here and talk to the top experts of SQL Server at Microsoft in the world. Where, where else can you get that? Yeah, you'll exactly. get it at Ignite. I mean, yeah. you'll get it here, right? Yeah. So. How we can, by the way, how we can adopt uh, that, at least small part of that Microsoft Clinic in SQL Day in Poland? Oh, I think it's not <laughs> hard at all. Um, no? I remember being at SQL Day, and there were several people from Microsoft there, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. Or even just the experts. If you think about your speakers that come to SQL Day, right? Those are your experts, right? Yeah. All you honestly, all you need for a clinic is a couple of tables and some laptops, <laughs> and maybe a whiteboard. Yeah, true. But I'm 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 talking about you know the the guys, the people from Microsoft. I see. Maybe not I see. only the, from Redmond, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. No, I mean I think th we've organized these kind of smaller clinic events at other like SQL Saturday events. Mm -hmm. We've gotten some of the local Microsoft resources, the PFE engineers or the architects that are in those areas of the world or that city, and we said, hey, let's just get a small little table set together and we'll advertise a clinic, and we'll just tell people come up and ask us questions and it really is easy to put this together as long as you can get people that are willing to staff it and answer questions mm -hmm. you just need a laptop so you can show something and a couple of tables and you've got a that's clinic yeah. that's how we started this right <laughs> uh, and then look what it's become it's become an amazing amazing thing so. okay I think we, we we must try to do that yeah <laughs> you should yeah you okay. should call it the clinic too <laughs> <laughs> yeah I will I will yeah. today yeah, yeah. Because, because I have one question uh, one um, basically one big problem but there's a couple of questions, yeah. But sure. I will, yeah. Okay. I, I will try to find uh, the <laughs> appropriate people or appropriate go. team. There you go. Really, last question. Sure. Are you a per perfectionist? Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> well, if you ask my wife this question, she uh. would probably say yes. <laughs> if you ask people that see me present or, or talk to me, they would probably say yes. I don't consider myself that. I do consider myself a person who's thorough. Uh, and I'm a big believer in accuracy uh -huh. and making sure that I do the best I possibly can to present what's right, which, which is correct. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm, I'm a big believer in correct. I would rather do things that are correct and that you understand than be polished, if that makes okay. sense. Mm -hmm. Of course, I've gotten, I've spoken now for 20 plus years, so I've gotten kind of all those combined together now. But no, I don't, I, I don't think uh, I'm a perfectionist. No, I don't, I don't think that. Maybe, maybe people think that I am, but I try not to focus too much on perfection. I mean, Yesterday I had a small incident in my Linux talk where, where I had a problem with, uh, in, in my demos and I was you know not happy about it but yeah. most people said they couldn't see that I was angry or anything and no, no. I'm still not happy <laughs> but I'm not going to let it affect yeah. the rest of my yeah. life because of it so no I would say I'm I'm close to perfection but is but I'm not <laughs> that no. okay uh, Bob, thank you very much. Thank uh, you for, for having me. Here again. I hope you found yes. this helpful. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Thank yeah, you make sure you make sure you send it to me so I can hear it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I will. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah. And by the way, we would like to invite you if you have time. If you would like to come, you are always uh, uh, you are always welcome in SQL Day in Wrocław. Yeah. Oh, you so that's, so that's so nice of you. Always, always open. That's uh, thank you. You're so kind. Thank you for the invitation. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for thank your time. You very much. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Damien. Thank you for joining us, listening this podcast and time spent jointly. You can find this podcast on website sqlplayer.net. Share this episode if you like it and let us know if you want to hear a specific person from SQL community or maybe about interesting topic or technology. Thank you very much for watching. As always, all useful links can be found in the description to this video. Please give me a thumb up if you like this video or leave a comment down below. Also, if you appreciate work like this and video like this, please hit the subscribe button so I can reach out more people in SQL community who might be interested in listening to this podcast or watching other videos in this channel. In the meantime, have a fantastic day and see you in the next video. Bye.